Today's video is on energy and ATP. So first let's have a look at what ATP is. So ATP is a molecule that is made from adenine, which is a nitrogen containing organic base, which is found in DNA as well. It is made of a ribose, which is a pentose sugar, meaning a sugar containing five carbons. And it also has phosphates. A chain of three phosphate groups is attached to the ribose sugar, as you can see here, one, two, and three. And this makes ATP adenosine triphosphate, named because it has adenine and three phosphate groups, triphosphate. So the bonds between these phosphates are unstable as each phosphate group is negatively charged. So they repel each other. And as they go along the chain, there is more repulsion and the repulsion gets stronger. So these bonds will hold more energy. And when it says a lot of energy, it is only a lot in respect to the other bonds, not a lot on the grand scale of it. And this means that these phosphate bonds have a low activation energy to be broken. So these bonds can easily break. And when these uh, bonds are broken, they release a considerable amount of energy. And this is why ATP is our energy containing molecule that we use for uh, releasing energy. So the hydrolysis of ATP. Hydrolysis purely means the breaking down through the addition of water. So the hydrolysis of ATP equation shows an ATP molecule having the addition of water to create ADP and a phosphate group and energy. So ADP is adenosine diphosphate, meaning two phosphates because it's lost one of them. And PI is the notation for phosphate group. And this hydrolysis reaction is catalyzed by ATP hydrolase. And this hydrolysis reaction releases energy as we can see in the equation here. So this release of energy is catalyzed by this enzyme ATP hydrolase. So now moving on to the formation of ATP. So we've looked at the hydrolysis of ATP and how it releases energy. Now we're looking at how we form ATP. So this hydrolysis reaction that we've just looked at, where we have ATP, we add water and we get ADP and a phosphate group, is in fact reversible, meaning we can switch the equation around. So we add ADP to the phosphate to get back our original ATP plus our water. And this is a condensation reaction, which is the formation of a molecule through the removal of water. So we have our ATP and the water created. So ATP synthase is another enzyme, and this catalyzes the phosphorylation of ADP. And phosphorylation means the addition of a phosphate group. So when we add ADP to a phosphate group, we get back our ATP. So this is our enzyme over here, ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is an enzyme that converts potential energy of a H plus gradient. So as you can see in this diagram here, we have more H plus or protons on this side of the membrane than this side. So we have a concentration gradient of H plus or protons. And a concentration gradient has potential energy. And this enzyme, ATP synthase, converts this potential energy of this gradient into chemical energy. And the enzyme uses this chemical energy that it converted from the potential energy of this gradient to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphates. So you can see here, we have our ADP and phosphate coming to our ATP synthase that's using this energy of the gradient to create this ATP from our reactants. 
So the formation of ATP is just the addition of a phosphate to our ADP, the phosphorylation of ADP. But there are many ways also that we can do this. And one of them is photophosphorylation. And this is where in chlorophyll containing plant cells, um, the addition of phosphate to an ADP molecule occurs. So the formation of ATP happens in chlorophyll containing plant cells. It also happens in oxidative phosphorylation, which is where the addition of a phosphate to ADP takes place in plant and animal cells during respiration. So respiration forms ATP molecules. We also um, have this occur during substrate level phosphorylation. So this is where in plant and animal cells, we have a phosphate group transferred from donor molecules to our ADP. So molecules give up their own phosphate groups to the ADP molecule to form ATP. So now we're going to look at the energy storage of ATP. So ATP, ATP bonds are unstable, as we've seen, because of the negatively charged phosphates repe repelling each other. So this means that our ATP molecules are quite short-lived because eventually the bonds will break because they are unstable. So this means that ATP is an immediate source of energy, one that we use quickly. We don't leave for long-term storage. We create it as we need it. And as a comparison, we know that fats and carbohydrates have stable bonds in comparison to our unstable ATP bonds. So these stable bonds in fats and carbohydrates allow them to form long-term energy storage molecules. And ATP is readily reformed through the phosphorylation of ADP, making it a very good immediate source of energy because it is quickly reformed through this phosphorylation. And so one mole of ATP releases 34 kilojoules of energy, while in comparison, one mole of glucose releases 1,200 kilojoules of energy. And ATP does release energy in much smaller and more manageable amounts, meaning we don't waste as much energy as we do with glucose. If we only need a small amount of energy for a small reaction, we don't want to be creating large amounts of energy where we'll have excess that we waste. ATP allows us to be able to create these small packages of energy that are just the right amount for our small reactions. And so the hydrolysis of ATP, which we've looked at, into this ADP molecule is in just one reaction. Whereas the breakdown of glucose involves many reactions, meaning that ATP um, is a much quicker release of energy because it breaks down in one reaction while glucose involves many, many reactions. And so ATP cannot be stored. It must be continuously made because it is unstable, short-lived, and we can't use it as a storage molecule that is for fats and carbohydrates and so on. So ATP is continuously made in our body because we cannot store it. And lastly, we'll look at the uses of ATP. Firstly, ATP is used in metabolic processes. Um, so this is building up macromolecules from basic units. For example, uh, by making starch out of glucose molecules. So ATP is used in these metabolic processes. Um, ATP is also used in movement, so muscle contractions. And so the energy is used when muscle filaments slide past each other and so shorten the muscle fibre, allowing our muscles to contract to allow movement. Um, ATP is also used in active transport, which is the movement of substances from an area of high, uh, low, from low to high concentration. Uh, so against the concentration gradient. 
So ATP is used in changing the shape of our carrier molecules in the plasma membrane to allow us to move against that concentration gradient. It's also used in secretion, in forming lysosomes necessary for the secretion of our cell products. So lysosomes transport these secretory products to the cell membranes, fuse with the cell membranes and allow us to secrete the products out of the cell. Um, it's also used in the activation of molecules. So this is when the phosphate released from the hydrolysis of ATP, so when ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and a phosphate group. This phosphate can phosphorylate another molecule, so this phosphate released from ATP can be joined with another molecule and this makes this molecule more reactive and so lowering the active en activation energy of this other molecule. So the phosphate group from ATP when hydrolyzed is attached to another molecule making it more reactive lowering the activation energy of this enzyme catalyzed reaction. And some other examples of how AT ATP is used in our body is DNA replication, endo and exocytosis, which is when products are um, removed and taken into the cell, cell division, protein synthesis, co-transport, which is a type of active transport, and transport vesicles in the Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum also use this ATP. It is a very important molecule in our body and we would not be able to survive without it.